Uh, okay, let's let's get started. Okay, welcome welcome to the special session today. Uh, the session uh, consists of three uh, individual talks from uh, experimental uh, research centers at IBS, uh, CUP uh, Center for uh, Underground Physics, and CAPP uh, Center for Action and Precision Physics research. Okay, so first talk uh, will be given by. Uh, uh, Young Ju Ko uh, from uh, CUP, and uh, he will be talking about uh, doc, uh, documented search uh, in the cosine 100 experiment uh, currently happening at, 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 at CUP. Uh, Young Ju, are you ready? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, pretty good. Okay. Can you hear? Can you see my screen? Beautiful. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Young Jugo, and I'm working on cosine collaboration. And I'll talk about the dark matter search at the cosine hundred. So this is content of my slide. First, I will introduce the cosine hundred. And second, I will talk about the status of recent analysis. And last, I will present plan for next phase. So there is no sign of SI WIMP for 10 to the minus 46 square centimeter at 30 GB mass as shown in left plot. And recent project focus on very low mass range. But there is only one exception, Dama Libra experiment. Dama Libra is an experiment to search for dark mirror annual modulation, uh, annual modulation signal with the sodium iodine crystal. And they claim dark mirror observation with 7.5 sigma confidence level. And the observed signal is constant with dark mirror in terms of phase and period. And recently, they announced the results of phase two with several improvements, such as 1 kb threshold. In this phase, they also see the modulation signal due to the dark matter with the 12 sigma confidence level, as shown in the, those plots. These results are still, com uh, still compatible with the nature of dark matter candidates. And there are several experiments using the sodium iodine crystal to test the signal observed by Dama Libra. So this shows global effort using sodium iodine <coughs> detector. So Picoron in Japan succeeded in development of low background NEI crystal as shown in red box. And they have plans to start phase one at spring in this year with 23.4 23 kilogram crystal. Sabre has two experimental sites. One is Gransasu and the other is Stawel. And they also got a low background sodium iodide crystal, which has similar background level to Dama, about one count, day, count per day per kilogram per KEV. And they had planned to start measurement with the small crystal and the scintillator from last to August. Anise and cosine are in stage of data taking. So the anise collects data with nine 12.5 kilogram NAI modules since August 2017. They reach it to 1 kb threshold, and the background level is 2 to 5 uh, DRU. Their first result with 1.5 year data shows a preference for no, no annual modulation, but uncertainties are not enough to rule out the DAMA signal. And a few months ago, ANAIS presents a result based on time dependent modeling. The top right plot shows rate distributions for nine NAI modules. 
and they use three kinds of modeling denoted by equation four, five, and six for modulation fee. The table shows the data result, and as a result, data support no dark matter annual modulation and incompatible with the DAMA at about three sigma level. Cosine is a joint effort between DMIs and KIMS to search for dark matter interaction. And the goal of the current stage is to verify the DAMA signal using the same target material, sodium iodine. Our experimental site is Yangyang Underground Laboratory in Korea. And this place has about 700 meters rock overburden and we start data taking in September 2016. Cosine use eight low background NAI crystals and mass is about 100 kilogram in total. Uranium, thorium, and potassium level is less than DAMA, but total alpha ray is higher than DAMA. So total background level of cosine is two to three times that of DAMA, but we have a higher right yield. Each crystal is encapsulated in copper and we use two, three inch PMTs for each crystal. NAI detector is surrounded by liquid scintillator. We use about 2,000 liters LAB-based LS and 5-inch PMTs, and it is designed to accommodate twice as many crystals, so we can use this shield structure for detector upgrade. This LS detector is used as an active shield via LS V2 system. Next layers are passive shield, 3 cm thick copper and 20 cm thick grid. And our most layer is 4-5 muon, muon counter. We also built the neutron monitoring system. We can monitor the fast and summer neutrons with the LS and helium-3 gas detector <coughs> respectively. Our monitoring system has more than 200 parameters. And this plot shows the DAQ system status, such as trigger ray, PMTHB status, and preamp, and so forth status. And environmental parameters, such as temperature, humidity, and radon level, are stable as shown in this right plot. And we are also monitoring the neutron ray. So this bottom plot shows total exposure of cosine 100. The efficiency is almost 94% and the exposure time is longer than 1500 days with, uh, with uh, rather than 92% good data. And we named the data according to the period such as set one and set two and set three. And 37 plastic scintillator panels are used as muon counter and it surround the reed shield at the almost radio. Muon ray has been monitored and correlated events in crystal detector are fitted. And we performed the study on muon annulation, annual modulation and also reported the correlation with the temperature. For understanding of LS detector, we use giant four based simulation and the detector response is well understood. Internal background is low enough as shown in the right plot and it is used for between the multiple heat events. For all events in two to six K region, the tagging efficiency is about 20% and for potassium 40, LS Vito system has about 70% tagging efficiency. In this bottom plot, in this bottom left plot, black circles are total events and blue dots are coincidence events. And you can see that the most of CKB peak due to the potassium 40 is in the blue distribution. From now, we can move to the uh, analysis status. 
There are two types of noise as shown in the bottom plot. And we use boosted decision tree called BDT to distinguish the scintillation signals in the blue circle from noise events. To separate those two types of noise, we used two kinds of BDT, and then the 2KB threshold is available. Available with about 70% efficiency. And we found another type of noise below 2KB as shown in this red circle. And so we developed a new likelihood parameter based on pulse shape and it shows a good separation power for this type of noise. BDT is also used, also used uh, with this new parameter, and then we can reach to 1K session with about 80% efficiency. And we use detector simulation based on GIANT4, and it reproduces the measured spectral wear as shown in this plot. And main backgrounds in low energy region are internal contamination of uranium, sodium, and potassium, and cosmogenic activation of tritium and surface contamination by PB210 are also dominant components of background. And for set data modeling, we extend the energy range 1 to 3,000 keV and improve the modeling we are better understanding of surface PV210 and adding the iodine-129 and the rock gamma. So we reported the first exclusion of gamma signal using the same sodium iodine crystal. This analysis is ray plus spectral shape analysis with the 2 kb threshold, and we assume the canonical spin the independent model and standard HAL model. And the set data with 1KB threshold shows an order of magnitude improvement. And thanks to that, the DAMA is ruled out in spite of different Kent factor scenario. So this, in this right plot, solid lines use nearly measured Kent factor and blue dotted contour is DAMA a load region using quenching factor measured by DAMA. And we also performed the WIMP extraction analysis with isospin violating SI model, and also with effective field theory operators. So we can fully cover the alternative scenarios for the quenching factor and effective field theory op operators. Next is annual modulation analysis. This is a model independent analysis and we use single exponential with a constant function to fit the set to data. And the result agrees both of DAMA and absence of modulation as shown in this bottom plot. In this bottom plot, the red field area shows one sigma competence region and you can see the null and DAMA in this tradition. And the sensory data analysis is ongoing. We use about three years data with one KB threshold and thanks, good, thanks to good understanding of cosmogenic components, background can be modeled with 14 different time dependent components for each crystal. And we have developed a Bayesian based analysis tool and we use realistic pseudo experiments for validation of our machinery. And the result shows the data constant with the neural hypothesis, but do not, do not rule out the data signal. So we have a plan for combined analysis with Anais 112 and expect that it will provide the better understanding about the DAMA signal. There is another effort to validate the DAMA signal. We try to use a similar method to DAMA. DAMA uses residual P for yearly average as similar to bottom plot. Black dots show our data in the bottom plot and the red lines show how to apply this method. 
and the right plot shows the residual and its fit result. As you can see in here, the strong negative modulation due to the uh, decreasing background shape and, and so increasing rate can make positive modulation as predicted in this paper. We also try to use the exponential background subtraction for comparison. And this shows the a constant result with the null hypothesis. And we try to make quantitative estimates of possible bias in DAMA. So we generate a pseudo data set, assume, and we assume the null hypothesis and cosine background composition, and also assume the background ray from DAMA's rate distribution in 2 to 6 KAB. And then try to register feed through yearly average and we can get a similar size to DAMA, but negative sign. We also perform the exotic uh, dark matter searches, such as solar action, inelastic boosted dark matter, and analysis on bosonish per whip is ongoing. From here, our plan will be introduced. Cosine 100 background is two to three times higher than Dama and Dama Libra. So we have plans to roll background level. In-house development for the entire process can help for that. First step is NAI powder purification. These equipment are used for powder purification and through so the development of this process, we got the good enough purity as shown in this table. And next step is crystal growing. We grow the NAI crystal with a small size of test grow. And the result shows that crystal still has very high purity. And we try to assemble the detector with this crystal at the same place and from this result, our expected background level is much smaller than that of DAMA as shown in this bottom plot. It is about 0.2 or 0.3 DIU. Moreover, we installed a full-size grower designed and built based on small test grower and we succeed, succeed to get the 10 centimeter ingot with the 50 kilogram mass via successful seeding and growing. So cosine 200 is next phase of cosine 100. And we can use the cosine 100 shield and we will use the, use the ultra pure crystal. The experiment is scheduled to launch in the first half of 2023. And model independent conclusion of Dama Libra is possible within three years as shown in this bottom right plot. We already reached to 1KB threshold, so three years are enough to validation as shown in this plot, the black dotted line with the green and yellow bands. And there are many efforts to lower the, lower the energy threshold. First, we have developed a novel technique for the crystal encapsulation based on direct attachment of crystal to PMTs. It allows about 50% increased ripe yield and it will use, and we will use this design for cosine 200. And we are still working hard on event selection technique. Improved multivariable technique showed to about 0.5 KB energy threshold achievable and we are also focusing on event selection via deep learning. The rest one is low temperature measurement. This measurement, uh, the measurement at minus 35 degree of Celsius shows about 10% increased alpha quenching and about 5% right yield improvement. So the operation at about minus 30 degree of Celsius is under consideration for the cosine 200. Now we- 
how many slides do you have? You have two minutes, two more minutes. Yeah, almost done. Okay, good. And now we assume those expected improvement, improvement mass, background level, right yield, and threshold, and catch factor. And then we estimate expected background with one year exposure as shown in this left plot. Based on this, we estimate the detector sensitivity for WIMP nucleon SI interaction as shown in this right plot. And the red line with the yellow and green bands shows the sensitivity of cosine 200. And the thin red line without band is cosine 120. And sodium iodide are both proton odd elements. So thanks to that, we have advantage for wimp proton spin dependent interaction. So we expect to be able to compete, uh, able to compete with the PICO in low mass region as shown in this top right flat. Moreover, the pulse shape discrimination of a nuclear recall event can make an improvement for high mass WIMP and this PSD can be improved via low temperature measurement. So this is summary of my slides. The cosine is an experiment to reproduce the DAMA signal with the same target material, sodium iodine. And DAMA result is excluded by cosine 100 data under the several scenarios and a model independent annual modulation analysis shows the constant result with the null hypothesis, but not enough data cannot make judgment for Damas clay. R&D for next phase is actively in progress, such as ultra pure crystal, its encapsulation, event selection technique, and low temperature measurement. The physiology test with those expected improvements demonstrates global competitiveness of cosine 200 after DAMA Libra qualification. Yeah, that's sure, and thank you for your attention. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Very nice summary of your, of your, of your project. So, okay, uh, uh, there's some questions from Stefano Scopel. Uh, Youngju, are you, are you able to see the, see the questions? So if, if, you, if you look at the Q and A buttons on the bottom of your, your Zoom screen, if you click there, you can, you can see the, the questions from, from Stefano. So I need to stand on this. Okay. Oh. Ah, yes, uh, yeah, as you can see here, the, our background, uh, our data and background modeling is one to 3,000 uh, KB region. So we can search with those uh, energy region. And actually uh, our bosonic for WIMP search is uh, from one to 1,000 uh, KB region. Yeah. And this is ongoing. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. So. So uh, particularly, this detector is pretty much in a sensitive to the relatively low low energy dark matter. So, so okay. Uh, is there any other questions? 
So if you if you have any questions, please you know, use the uh, Q&A button and then type and then such that the speakers can read and answer to it. Uh, so then, then let me let me ask a question. If if you go to the slide eighteen, so can you? Can you remind me what what is the how how these two numbers are different or what kind of you know what 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 scenario what assumption was there one is minus and the other one ah. plus which means so I, rep, I yeah 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 so rep mm -hmm. is we use the subtraction of background mm -hmm. uh, with this year average way okay yeah and the at uh, the, the right is the exponential we use exponential background and the subtract this background from data and then we fit the modulation fitting mm. so this black dot minus this red flat line mm -hmm. is this data point and then we fit this data point with the cosine function so you're saying the damas analysis yeah, this is basically is Dhamma's way. Yeah. Yeah, okay. right. Gotcha, gotcha. All right. Okay, good, thank you. Oh, okay, there is another question from, from Yon. Yeah, below 2KB, we uh, find this another type of noise, but uh, we don't know uh, the origin of this noise, but the pulse shape uh, is uh, the uh, initial part is very sharp uh, shape uh, with, uh, normal, with uh, similar to normal noise, but it has very uh, high a very large tail in the uh, delayed uh, in the large time distribution. Yeah, so it cannot be separated with those mean time parameters such as uh, we use the parameters. So we uh, developed uh, uh, we developed a new likelihood. We use new likelihood method based on whole. Uh, whole pulse shape information. Yeah. Okay, I first, I, I apologize for the, for the, all, all the participants. Okay, so the first question from Stepano was about uh, some of the uh, documental model, you know, uh, ha has some relatively large uh, mass, uh, at, uh, at relatively large energy. So his question is, you know, there is any plan or, you know, uh, uh, desire to, Increase the threshold up to 100 or even one mega uh, electron volt, and then it was uh, yeah. It was the first question, and then the second question from Yuan is, uh, they the recent they uh, lowered the, the threshold from two keV to one keV, and then there is a, a new type of you know noise is coming up, and then and there was the, there was a the question. From you on. okay, my my apology. I didn't know that to to read these things and and then let let all the the participants. Okay, so any other any other questions? Uh, okay, okay, thank you. Otherwise, uh, okay, thank you very much, Youngju, and then and then okay. So the next talk. Uh, will be given by Uyan Chong from CAPP. Uh, he will talk about uh, action document searches in Korea. So Uyan. Okay. Okay, good. Uh, okay, can you see it? Yes. All right. And then yeah, please share your screen for us. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, hold on. Uh, Hold on, hold on. I should have done that before. I should 
Uh, yep. Can you see it? Yes. Okay. All right. Um, thank you very much. Um, okay, hold on, hold on. Uh, I'd like to thank the organizers uh, for inviting me. Um, my name is Uyan Chang. I'm from. I'm working for uh, CAPP at IBS in Korea. Um, I'd like to talk about the, uh, the Axion Dark Matter search in uh, IBS CAP in Korea. Um, we have, uh, it's, it's almost uh, seven and a half years uh, since we started uh, from the scratch. And uh, now we have uh, multiple Axion detectors and uh, uh, trying to launch the uh, uh, flagship experiment. So, I'd like to say something about the status of our experiment. And also I'd like to talk about, uh, oh, well, my ma main focus should be the, uh, the improvement we have to do and uh, we, we are doing uh, for the accelerating the Axion Dark Matter experiment. Okay, this is my outline. Uh, I'd like to say briefly about the dark matter axion and uh, how to detect them. Uh, and also, we, I'd like to say uh, more about uh, how we are doing uh, with the experiment. With our exper uh, the axion search program is called the Cool Task CAPS Ultra Low Temperature Axion Search in Korea. And uh, we have been taking uh, data since uh, 2018. And, uh, and also the, the second part, I'd like to say more about uh, the R&D efforts that we are doing uh, to increase our scan rate. And I'll go into the summary. So the <clears throat> Axion wasn't born as a, 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 as a dark matter. Uh, it, it was born as a, a, a solution to the strong CP problem. Uh, Peche Quinn uh, introduced a, a new global symmetry, which is uh, spontaneously broken at the energy scale, FA. Uh, and then uh, there, uh, the CP, the result is CP uh, conservation is preserved dynamically. So the, evidently people realize that uh, uh, if there is a, a continuous uh, symmetry is broken, then there must also be an associated particle, Goldstone boson. And they called that, uh, Frank Wolchek actually called it at the axion. And once he said uh, one needed a particle to clean up a problem named after a detergent. Uh, this is the uh, the axions I encountered uh, two years ago in Bogota, Colombia. I didn't bring any yet. Uh, so the axion is a, a gold a pseudo goldstone boson, and uh, it's extremely weakly interacting, and it has a, a very small mass, and uh, uh, it's extraordinarily abundant. Okay in numbers. So it has all the uh, requirement of being a uh, excellent dark matter candidate. And also if uh, we can solve this problem, we can also solve the CP violation. So the detection scheme we adopted is the, the halo scope that was proposed by Professor Sikiwi of uh, University of Florida long time ago, actually 1983. So in his scheme, the axions will convert to photons in a very strong magnetic field. So the <clears throat> uh, finding, discovering axion is like uh, uh, killing two birds with one stone. So we can solve uh, oops, both uh, patch, uh, the strong CP problem and also dark matter problem. 
So in the detection scheme, there are two things we have to remember that uh, uh, in order to, is, this is the extremely small signal. So in order to detect it, we have to maximize the, uh, the signal and also uh, minimize the, the noise. So in order to maximize the signal, we have to use a very powerful and possibly very huge bore magnet. And, and also the, with a, a large, uh, with the lining up the electric field of the axion with the magnetic field, and also use the uh, very high quality character uh, cavity. And also to uh, minimize the noise, we have to use, uh, minimize the uh, physical temperature of the cavity and also the, the noise from the amplifiers. But at the end of the day, all we care is the scan rate. Uh, if you reduce the, uh, if you reduce the uh, noise temperature by 10 times, we can uh, speed up the experiment 100 times. So this is the, uh, the cartoon of our uh, CAPS uh, experiment in a nutshell. Uh, here you can see that in, in order to minimize the uh, uh, noise temperature, we have to minimize the, uh, uh, we have to lower the temperature of the uh, phys physical temperature of the cavity in our dilution refrigerator, and also the employing uh, quantum amplifier, we can reduce the uh, noise to the quant uh, standard quantum limit. And also to maximize the uh, signal, we can use uh, uh, as large as possible uh, superconducting cavity with a large bore. Ah. And, uh, uh, and also we can employ a very high Q-factor cavity, which is a superconducting cavity. So the, even though the haloscope is the most sensitive method known today, we still have a very wide range of mass to scan. So we need a, a breakthrough or innovation to uh, speed up the search. So uh, fortunately, the, there had been a, a really uh, great advan advance of the uh, superconducting technology, including Josephson junctions and uh, JPA uh, or the superconducting tapes. So, so I'll talk about the, the improvements that it can uh, take advantage of. So this is uh, the comparing with the run we had with the uh, uh, silicon-based uh, hemp amplifier and our small cavity. So if you use a 12 Tesla 32 centimeter bore uh, superconducting magnet, then our uh, scanning speed factor will be, uh, scanning speed will be 100 times faster. And also if you use a superconducting cavity, then also, it, it contributes to uh, uh, more than 10 or 20 times faster a scan. And to minimize the noise, if we reach uh, the quantum limit with our quantum amplifiers, then uh, we can uh, also increase the uh, uh, scanning speed uh, uh, approximately about 50 times. But in the future, if you go for the very high uh, frequency, then uh, you have to use a single photon detector in the future. And also if you like to uh, fill all the gaps in, in, the high frequency, uh, in the high frequencies without sacrificing volume, you have to uh, do an r and on, uh, on multiple cavities or uh, employing dielectric rings or metamaterial with the superfluid uh, uh, liquid helium tuning sort of stuff. So uh, this is to show uh, what we have done uh, last seven years. Uh, we were founded uh, to 2013 and until 2016, we haven't done much. 
uh, getting all our equipments and uh, uh, building our facility. So 2016, uh, we had uh, two dilution refrigerators and started uh, constructing a low vibration pad area in the Munji campus at KAIST. And the 2017, we have uh, two more dilution refrigerators. And by 2018, we were taking data. Uh, in 2019, we had two more uh, Axion experiments. And uh, this year, uh, we are uh, expecting to launch uh, uh, 12 Tesla, our main flagship experiment, uh, CAP 12 TB. Uh, so this is the uh, uh, CAPS experimental hole. Uh, the picture was taken last year. And you can see in the bottom uh, <clears throat> CAP 9T MC multiple cavity and CAP PACE, our first experiment, and uh, CAP ATB, which has a little bigger cavity. And in the center, uh, you can see that CAP 12 TB, the picture of uh, CAP 12 TB, uh, live in fridge. So these are the summary, table summary of uh, uh, the refrigerators and magnets at CAP, uh, CAPP. Uh, so we have uh, seven refrigerators and uh, uh, one, two, three, uh, five magnets. Uh, and uh, this year we'll have uh, one more magnet, which is 12 Tesla, a little smaller bore, like 10 centimeters. And these are the experiments that, that we had uh, results of, uh, CAP PACE, CAP ATB, and the CAP MC. I'll go a little more detail in the next the following pages, but uh, CAP PACE last year uh, started to use uh, JPA and uh, was able to lower the uh, noise temperature and enhance the scanning speed. And in the future, and also this year, uh, we like to use uh, superconducting cavity, our axion experiment. So this is uh, uh, axion landscape, the parameter space before CAP comes into the scene. Uh, so the CAP pace was the first uh, commissioning uh, experiment uh, with uh, scanning around uh, 2.5 gigahertz. And uh, if we were able to scan about 250 uh, megahertz range with the 10 KSVZ uh, sensitivity. And also we are going into uh, very deep into a KSVZ range uh, with only one megahertz range. Our physical temperature was uh, 38 millik, uh, the physical temperature of the cavity. But uh, using Hempty amplifiers, our uh, noise temperature was around 1K. So this the result was uh, uh, published in a PRL. So the CAP ATB is the very similar experiment to uh, CAP PACE, but it has more, uh, the, is a bigger uh, cavity, which is 3.5 uh, liter. Uh, with a little bigger bore magnet, the same A Tesla, but uh, the Hempty amplifier is also used in the experiment. Uh, and it, it's, uh, it's the uh, first published result by CAB also in PRL. And uh, this is a CAB MC, a 90 MC is our, uh, the first, uh, axion uh, multiple uh, first axion experiment with the multi cell cavity ever. So, and this the result also was uh, published in PRL. So, last year uh, we used uh, uh, in, in our cap pace experiment, we used to uh, uh, employ the JPA and uh, our 
temperature, noise temperature is low enough to give us uh, uh, the scanning speed uh, more than uh, 30 times, actually close to 40 times. Uh, so we are preparing for the publication for this one right now. So I'll uh, talk a little more about uh, JPA R&D projects. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, we are collaborating with uh, uh, Japan's uh, uh, Professor Nakamura's group of uh, University of Tokyo and RIKEN. Um, so far, we got uh, a little more than 200 JPA chips uh, delivered, uh, and the range, frequency range was uh, one to six gigahertz. Uh, and we all packaged it uh, at CAP. Um, the first three sets we tested was around uh, one, one gigahertz and 2.3 gigahertz and six gigahertz. So one, one gigahertz JPA is for the preparation for uh, CAP 12 TB, our main experiment. Uh, and 2.3 gigahertz is a cap pace experiment, which I mentioned before. It shows uh, an excellent noise temperature of uh, <clears throat> 120 millik, which is close to a uh, standard quantum limit. And uh, we completed the uh, scanning through uh, around 30 megahertz range. Uh, and the, the result was a uh, uh, very much improved uh, scanning speed about 30 to 40 times. And six gigahertz JPA is for the higher frequency with the same volume employing uh, uh, six and cell, uh, A cell cavities in two experiments, cap pace and cap uh, ATB. And they're, um, the result of the noise temperature of 6 gigahertz JPA is uh, around 150 milli K. So it looks very nice. And also it has the wider uh, band, uh, dynamic range so that we can cover about uh, two to 300 megahertz of the frequencies. This experiment is going to begin uh, in the summer. And uh, we also uh, test, we are also going to test a, wide, a much wider band a traveling wave type uh, JPA from INF in Italy and, uh, and also uh, Lancaster University from UK. And uh, we are also doing a research on single photon detectors for the uh, preparing for the higher frequency axion search. So this is the this is the result of uh, uh, a 3.3 uh, gigahertz 2.3 gigahertz APA, and it was uh, submitted to uh, oh it was published in uh, SUST, uh, and we used have, yes. So you have three minutes. You you may want to speed up. Okay. A little bit. Yeah. All right. All right. Three minutes. I think five. Okay, I'll speed up. Um, so, so we use this JPA for the uh, actual axion search last year. Uh, and this is the uh, JPA parameters and uh, a noise measurement uh, uh, result, which the, our total uh, system noise is uh, less than 200 millik. And this is the analysis of the uh, so the exclusion was uh, rather narrow of uh, 30, uh, 30 megahertz, but uh, actual, this is the R&D run and it, uh, the scanning speed increased about 40 times. And the superconducting cavity, um, superconducting cavity actually, it doesn't work with a, a high uh, magnetic field, but uh, we, uh, we choose the uh, YVCO family, actually uh, GDVCO. Uh, it's, uh, it, uh, it has a reasonably low surface resistance, even with the uh, magnetic field. So uh, our requirement is to have very high, uh, the, 
second critical uh, field and uh, a very high diffusing frequency. So this y, uh, YBC family tapes have by actually textured uh, uh, three axis, A, B axis and C axis. So it's, it is technically challenging to grow on a 3D surface. So we adapted to uh, uh, using commercially available uh, very high quality uh, HTS tapes and uh, using polygon style uh, design, we were able to uh, get about five times more uh, uh, quality factors, even at a Tesla uh, magnetic field. So this is the picture uh, simulation and our first cavity and uh, the result was uh, first try, the result was 150-ish. And the second one, we improved it a little bit uh, to have uh, 300, more than 300,000. But uh, our second generation was, yeah, <clears throat> last year we had the second generation superconducting cavity, which has a bigger volume of uh, uh, free, our central frequency was 2.3 gigahertz and uh, reducing uh, non-superconducting gaps and uh, removing Hestel law in the back, we were able to reach uh, more than uh, 500,000 Q factor, which is about uh, more than five times of the copper cavity. So we are, uh, we are going to use it to, uh, for Axion search uh, this year. So this is the uh, action experiment at CAP, before CAP. And now this is our uh, CAP's uh, contribution. And uh, we are planning to uh, take more data with the six gigahertz JPA and six cell cavity and A cell cavity. And together we like to do a face matching later. And also we are planning for the 2.3 gigahertz with the superconducting cavity and KVA TV is also planning for the 1.6 gigahertz uh, uh, run with the JPA. So all in all, the, our flagship experiment, a cap 12 TB with the JPA and the superconducting cavity uh, is planned. Right now we're using copper cavity of uh, 30 liters for now. Uh, so it's commissioning, actually the cooling down started today. So we are going to see the commissioning uh, uh, in the summer of, the, of this year. And uh, it, it, can, uh, it can search the Axion uh, about uh, one gigahertz uh, per year uh, with the possibly DFSG area. DFSG sensitivity, and uh, uh, we are also doing high frequency R&D in progress. So this is our plan to scan uh, one to eight gigahertz in less than five years. That's our plan. So in summary, uh, CAP has successfully established the multiple halo scope axion dark matter experiment in Korea for taking about seven years. Uh, through R&Ds, we like to speed up uh, our Axion search more. So with that, uh, we are doing R&D on uh, quantum amplifiers and superconducting cavity. But the major improvement will be on the CAP 12 TB for the next five years. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much for a you know, nice summary of the work. Mm -hmm. So, uh, it says uh, there is some time for well, Q and A. So if you have questions, please use the you know Q and A buttons on the bottom. So it looks like his target is pretty much clear, right? <laughs> okay. Oh, 
Okay, since mm -hmm. I don't see any questions, okay, uh, I, I, I take the speaker again. Mm -hmm. All right, so then the next talk uh, will be given by On Kim from CAPP2. Uh, he'll be talking about the, the very recent results from the, the new G minus two experiment at Fermilab. So On. Uh, yes, do you hear okay. me? Okay, yeah, yes, good. <clears throat> so yes, please share your screen. Yes, I'm sharing my screen and I expect you're seeing my slides. Yes, very good. Oh, thank you. All right. So shall I start now? Oh, yes, please. Okay, thank you. Um, so thank you very much um, for organizers to have me here. It's a nice workshop. And my name is On Kim. I'm also from the same center with a previous speaker, IBS CAPP in Korea. Our center not only um, performs the experiments for the axion, searching for axion dark matter, but also uh, participating in the precision physics research, such as the muon GMS2 experiment or storage ring EDM. So I'm um, one of the international collaborator of the muon G-2 experiment at Fermilab. So I'd like to sh uh, share the first result from the muon G-2 experiment at Fermilab that was officially announced um, in April of this year. So I'm pretty much sure that uh, a lot of you are already very familiar with this plot. So this plot shows you the, the recent data from the Fermilab muon G-2 experiment on the muon magnetic anomaly value. Um, it alone has a, like 3.3 .3 standard deviation away from the standard model, but it confirmed the, the experiment that was performed nearly 20 years ago in Brookhaven National Laboratory. So when combined this two experiments together that increased the tension between the standard model to 4.2 sigma, which is not insignificant value. So we really want to uh, do more. And this is only the first 6% of the collected data. I mean, the, the target data uh, statistics. So uh, I would like to say that we, we should stay tuned. So the contents of my today's talk is I'm gonna just brief, briefly survey the motivation and status of the muons G minus two. Then I'll go over the experimental techniques and details of the muons G minus two experiment at Fermilab. And then I'm gonna cover the, the first run, run one analysis result and the prospects of the, for the remaining uh, runs. So um, just to be, just for uh, introduction, uh, the magnetic dipole moment uh, mu and the spin s of the fundamental particles are, are, are related to each other. And this uh, coefficient g is called what's called g factor, which is expected exactly two for a spin one half fermion by Dirac theory of quantum relativistic quantum mechanics. Then it soon uh, turned out there exists an anomaly in the electron. So the G factor is a little bit uh, deviated from two, but there is some small, correct, small um, deviation. And this is what we call the anomaly. Then Schwinger uh, firstly derived this term in using the quantum electrodynamics. This is the, the first loop, a leading order quantum electrodynamics uh, Feynman diagram, and which is universal for all lap charged leptons. The value is alpha over two pi, where alpha is the fine structure constant, and it beautifully agreed with the measurement. So now in our model language of the standard model, we understand that the magnetic anomaly of the charged lepton um, can be decomposed into four different sectors, especially for the muon. Uh, the muon magnetic anomaly in standard model can be decomposed into uh, the sectors from quantum electrodynamics and electroweak and hadronic parts like hadronic vacuum polarization and hadronic light by light scattering. And those numbers are uh, really comprehensively and rigorously calculated by muon G minus two theory initiative last year uh, that reviewed all the uh, previous calculations and improved further. And you can see from this figure, this is standard model contribution on muon magnetic anomaly from different sectors. And you, the, the blue bars are their uh, contribution and the orange bars are their corresponding uncertainties. You can see the dominant contribution is from the QED, but the uh, uncertainties are dominated by the hadronic parts. 
Um, and what is the situation between the measurement and the uh, theory? So when the Brookhaven National Laboratory first <clears throat> performed the muon measurements to, uh, sorry, when the when in 20 years ago when Brookhaven National Laboratory um, um, announced their result on the muon G minus two, there was some um, discrepancy between the standard model expectation. And over the de decades, uh, there's some, um, some um, the, the theory part, which is represented in this blue dots are refined and refined. Now they reach to the, uh, the, la the white paper from the Mion G minus two theory initiative last year. And now in increased attention and bit, bit, uh, from the BNL result, but to the 3.7 standard deviation. So it strongly motivated the necessity of the new experiment. And there comes the Mion G minus two experiment at Fermilab, or in other words, the e E9A9. So this experiment aims to measure the Mion anomaly to the precision of 140 parts per billion, which is about four times as precise as the pre previous measurement in Brookhaven National Laboratory. So this is our target sensitivity. Uh, now I'm gonna uh, just cover the experimental uh, overview. So this is our the, the picture of our uh, muon G minus two storage ring. So with a diameter uh, 50 meter. So here the muon comes from this red beam line and it's uh, injected into this storage ring through the uh, super, superconducting inflector magnet, uh, which cancels the main magnetic field in the storage ring and makes sure the muon beam can be injected into the storage ring tangentially. And, but if we don't do anything after this injection, then these muons will have one revolution and most of them will hit inflector again and, and they're gone. So we have to kick the muon orbits onto the stable orbit using the uh, fast magnet called kicker magnet system. So the, the muon, trajectory is kicked from this uh, red dash circle to the, the green circle. And then we have the vertical focusing with the electric field, which we call electrostatic quadrupoles, which uh, confines the beam in the vertical uh, direction. So there are four quadrupole sections uh, in, in, inside this uh, storage ring, which covers roughly 40% of the circumference. And finally, we detect the, the Positrons when beyonds decay into positrons, and they occur into uh, one of the 24 electromagnetic parameters surrounding this storage ring. So now I'm gonna just briefly tell you about the measurement principle. So um, this uh, plot shows you uh, the top view of the storage ring, and uh, we we store the positive muons, and uh, there is a momentum. Uh, called specific momentum called matching momentum that ensures the spin precession rate with respect to the momentum is proportional to the muon anomaly. So when there is no anomaly and G factor is exactly two, then we will have this kind of frozen spin. So then the muon spin is always aligned parallel to the momentum direction like this. But if the anomaly exists, which is in our case, then uh, this matching momentum ensures that this spin precesses away from this momentum with a certain rate proportional to this muon anomaly. So we get this uh, spin precession frequency omega a proportional to the muon anomaly. So our aim is to measure this a mu. So we have to know this spin precession frequency and the magnetic field very precisely. So how do we measure this omega a? We exploit the um, self-analyzing muon decay. So we know that the dominant muon decay is a Michel decay, so muon decays into the positrons and the two, two corresponding neutrinos. And this parity violin weak decay causes that the decay positrons with high energies are preferred to be emitted along the muon spin direction. So if you look at this figure, um, this is the number of the decay positrons as a function of their energy in the laboratory frame. And when the spin processes, um, um, with respect to the momentum, you can see these curves oscillates. So when the spin is aligned with the momentum, this the number uh, density uh, above some threshold energy get maximized. But this uh, number, if we count this as a function of time, then we oscillate as a function of time because spin processes as a function of time. 
So that's how we get this uh, omega a from this wiggle plot. This is the uh, uh, nothing but just the time spectrum of the decay positrons uh, that is detected by our color meters as a function of time. So we extract the spin precession frequency omega a by feeding this wiggle plot but, uh, with the model function. Then we can extract this omega a. So actually measuring a mu, the mu anomaly is a little bit complicated than this uh, because we have to know this omega a very precisely. And also we have to know the magnetic field also very precisely. And there is a bunch of uh, terms, which is actually nothing that we care because what we measure is the only the first term. The other terms are just a combination of the known constants and they're already determined to the very high precision known to 24 parts per billion, which is quite small uh, compared to our total uncertainty budget. So what we have to figure out is to these two quantities, omega a, which is the spin precession frequency and omega p is the proton Larmor frequency uh, as a measure of magnetic field. So um, if we represent this omega a over omega p in a little bit more complicated form, uh, it becomes like this uh, rich, uh, rigorously represented form. But again, what's really important is uh, just these two things. One is the measured G minus frequency, and the other is the magnetic field weighted over the muon distribution, because what matters is the magnetic field that muons experience, not just all magnetic field inside the storage ring. So we have to determine this two very precisely. And also there are some factors from the beam dynamic systematic effects that we have to care about. And also this is a calibration factor for the NMR measurement for the magnetic field. And there are some magnetic field corrections from the transient magnetic field. And also there are some unblinding conversion factor. So I'm gonna just cover uh, this one by one for the first run. But before we go into the details, uh, this is just to help you grab the idea of what we do uh, to determine these uh, values. So omega a, this is the measure G minus frequency can be obtained by feeding this wiggle plot. And omega p is the magnetic field uh, we determine using the NMR measurement. And also this large M, capital M is the muon distribution that we also determine with the specialized detectors. So this is our current status. We are in the middle of the round four. Actually, we are marching to the end of the round four. And <clears throat> what we are, what I'm just uh, presenting is the result of the first run, run one, which is which only occupies six percent of the target statistics. Target statistics, and there is some subset of the run one. Uh, depending on the different electrostatic quadrupole high voltages and kicker high voltages and so on. So uh, let's look into the first quantity, which is the measure G minus frequency. So <clears throat> I, I told you that ideally we, we use this uh, fit parameter to, to determine this G minus frequency uh, by fitting, fitting this uh, model function into the wiggle plot. But actually in reality, this is not ideal because the detector acceptance is modulated by uh, some beam motions uh, and the beam systematic effects. So this uh, red curve here is the fit curve. And if we uh, subtract this uh, from the data and, and if we plot the residuals, then you can see there is some oscillation, residual oscillation. And if you free analyze this in the frequency uh, plane, then you, you can get, you can see this large uh, some peaks at the expected positions uh, that is expected by the beam dynamics. So we have to uh, we have to incorporate this beam dynamic effects into the fit function. So how do we measure those uh, transverse beam motions and lost muons? Uh, we have the detector called straw trackers. It measures the trajectory of the decay positrons and extrapolates to find the muon distribution inside the storage ring. So this is the top view of the one vacuum chamber section. And if the muons, uh, for example, they decay into the postron and it, it's uh, on its way to the color meter here. And there's some bunch of trace back chambers, we, what we call straw trackers, and they uh, measures the trajectory and extrapolate. So this is uh, the picture of the straw tracker. And this is actually what's reconstructed from the tracker data. So you can see this is uh, the beam 
number of counts as a in the radial position and the vertical position. And if you project this uh, into the radial position, then you can see, and, and you, if, if you also average them, then you can see this main, mean radial position oscillating as a function of time. This is especially what we call coherent detection oscillation. Uh, this has its own name because it has some important role and we have to understand this to understand the systematics. So it refers to coherent vector oscillation or CBO refers to the beam's coherent radial motion uh, with respect to the localized detector in our case, colorimeter. So this cartoon illustrates the, the, the coherent vector oscillation. And so if the muons uh, are oscillating with some, some, some frequency and our, our detector sees that it, it, goes, uh, it goes back and forth. Uh, with respect to the detector position. And this amplitude of this blue oscillation uh, is supposed to be as small as possible, but sometimes this amplitude can be uh, large by that is that could be driven by non-idea kicking of the beam. For example, if you look at this um, cartoon, then this black uh, distribution at the is what what the beam looks like in their phase space after uh, just just after when it's injected into the storage ring. But, and it goes to this position uh, when it's about to be kicked, but it's, uh, it, and then it's supposed to go kicked to the blue distribution. But if the kick is not ideal, then it can end up uh, being in, in the red distribution. Then it will oscillate with respect to the center and it will have a large CPU amplitude. This is what we have to uh, know and also avoid. There is another source of the beam dynamic systematic uncertainty, which is muon losses. Uh, it refers to unwanted muon depletion due to interactions with materials during the storage period. So for example, this uh, illustration shows you how the muons can touch this collimator by having a large pattern oscillation and then lose its energy quickly and be, it will be lost. Uh, we can actually measure the fraction of the muon losses by the technique called triple coincidences. We know that the muons leave just a, a minimal ionizing particles in the parameter and lose only a small fraction of the, its energy. And so it can keep having its momentum straight and it will just penetrate the uh, near neighboring parameters in a row. And we know that the, exactly the timing between these two parameters uh, signals should be around six nanoseconds. So we can reconstruct the fraction of the muon losses data. Uh, there is some uh, research and development from our center. Uh, one of our contribution is to develop this RF phase space matching technique to reduce the CPU and the muon losses. So this is the phase space uh, without the RF matching and the with the RF matching in the left and right hand side. And uh, with the RF matching, we apply the resonant RF electric field to reduce the, actually to move the beam. And ideally we can reduce the CPU and the muon losses. For example, the beam is more centered by the RF matching. So that means the CPU amplitude becomes reduced. And also if you look at the um, distribution inside this uh, danger zone, which is shaded in this orange uh, donut, then if you then you can realize that there's a less number of particles in, with the RF matching. So it means that the because those particles in this danger zone can is likely to hit this collimator and be lost during the storage period. So it means that the reduction of the mean losses. Uh, so going back to this uh, measured G minus the frequency measurement. Um, so we now have to incorporate all these important beam dynamic effects into the fin model. And actually the fin model becomes a little bit complicated, but now if you free analyze the residue of the um, wiggle plot, then <clears throat> you see the, oh, sorry. You see the, all the important uh, peaks are gone and you, and the, you can see the residue of the FT is becomes flat. And there are some beam dynamics corrections that we have to take into account. Um, sample, the E-field correction is that uh, we have to address this for the non-ideal momentum particle. For example, uh, we want to have these particles have uh, at, with the matching momentum, 
but experimentally it, it is impossible to have all the all the particles at the same momentum there should be some distribution and because that um off momentum particles will have some effect from the electric field uh so we have to correct this effect and there is some analytical calculation uh along with the measurement and we can determine this uh, value correction value and its own uncertainty and similarly there is a pitch correction uh this is uh refers to when there when the particle has a small vertical angle uh either upward or downward that tilts the spin precession uh frequency plane and it also affects the uh, omega a so we have to also address this and it can it could also be determined by the uh measurement from the tracker analysis and there's a muon loss correction um so if we look at this uh, uh cosine function which is uh which is involved in the fit model you can see you 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 actually expect this phase g minus two phase to be time independent uh because otherwise if you tailor expand this uh, time depending phase then the its first order will directly bias the omega a uh, we, we we have to avoid this or un, at least understand this so some sometimes this time depending uh phase time dependence uh can be uh happened by by the two related effects one is the spin momentum correlation and the other is momentum dependent losses so the first one spin momentum correlation is actually pre-exists before the injection due to the diaper bending magnet and also momentum dependent losses that we uh discover by the specialized systematic runs that we intentionally lower or increase the momentum of the muon beam and look at the the muon loss distribution and there is some discrepancy so it means that the muon losses are depending on their momentum so these two effects are correlated together and make the time depending phase but actually unfortunately it its effect is turned out to be very small um before we um, before I, yes so you have three minutes left oh okay thank you so before i go into the last part of the beam dynamic correction uh i want to um say something there was some challenge in the run one that uh, is the damaged quadruple registers so there is a high voltage registers connected to the uh, electrostatic quadruple plate that actually determines the uh, RC time constant of the quadruple plate charging up that is designed to be around five microseconds. And, but there's uh, two registers out of 32 were discovered to be damaged and a far larger resistance than the desired value. So it induced its slow changes to the beam dynamics. So this is a quadruple voltage uh, shape what it's supposed to be look like, but for the damage register, they are induced very slow changes. And most noticeably, the CBU frequency, which is also supposed to be flat, but it also drifted in time, and also vertical width changed slowly in time. Those things are amplified the phase acceptance systematic effect that I'm going to talk about now. So this phase acceptance uh, refers to that uh, the G minus two phase. Uh, of the accepted positrons depends on the muon decay position and energy by itself is not uh, harming us because um, it doesn't change the average phase uh, as a function of time but if there's a early to late beam motion modulation uh, then it can couple to this uh, phase modulation uh, sorry phase uh, um, position dependence and it also make the g minus the phase time dependent so that was amplified by these damaged registers. And uh, this actually turned out to be the largest uh, uncertainties because of this uh, large uh, modulation that is from the damaged registers. So actually I covered the nominator part, which is the G minus two frequency. And the denominator part is mostly the magnetic field determination. But because I don't have much time, I will just flash the, my slides. So we have some special tools and MR tools that to determine the uh, magnetic field inside the storage ring. Uh, there are two types. One is the fixed probes and the other is trolley. And we determine the magnetic field inside the storage ring. And eventually we want to uh, weight this over the muon distribution that is also determined by the tracker 
to make to calculate this factor and also we have some um effect from the transient magnetic field and we we discover that the actually um there's some eddy current effect so we have to uh address that because the kicker magnet uh magnetic field is very high pulse and the fast pulse it induces eddy currents in the surrounding metal and we have to uh measure how much the the um, remnant magnetic field induced by this eddy currents we we measure that with the faraday magnetometer and also there's a mechanical vibration on the quadruple plates those are very thin aluminum plates and we also charge them up uh parsing them like every 10 milliseconds so the Lorentz force between this and the neighboring metals uh, make these mechanical vibrations and it also made some uh, magnetic field so it also have large uncertainty mostly like because of the lack of the measurement so finally we have this uh, clock unblinding factor uh, that is locked in this cabinet and sealed in, in secret there's some um, uh, two individuals outside the collaboration set and know this uh, uh, blinding number for this clock. And finally, we unblind this, this uh, number together for the run one. Uh, more than 200 authors uh, gain, gathered in February this year. And this is what we get, what we got. So it alone has 3.3 .3 sigma tension, but now it confirmed the BNL reserves. So uh, experimental average, we have 4.2 sigma tension with the standard model. Both experiments are statistically dominated, so those are minimally correlated. And run one data is only 6% of the target statistics, so more results are on their way. And these are our run four run one analysis papers for, uh, on the beam dynamics and magnetic field and spin precession and the summary. So. Our status and improvements are as follows. So our TDR goal is uh, to take the 20, uh, around 20 times the BNL statistics. The final run is expected to be finished in the next year. And uh, we are now in the run four, ending the run four, and the analysis is ongoing for the run two and three. And there are some improvements since run one. The damage register were replaced immediately after run one and the magnetic, temp magnetic temperature stability was improved by upgrading the whole cooling system. And uh, also kicker was upgraded to increase the voltage and the beam is radially almost centered. So that is it. And thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you very much for your talk. So now it's time for questions. Okay, so on. Um, yes, I'm. Yeah, can, yeah. yeah. Can, can, can you go down uh, the bottom of the your you know Zoom slide and then you see the Q and A buttons. If you click oh, there, yeah. you, can, you, you see the questions. Uh -huh, so there is one you. questions. Yeah. Yeah, I saw uh, a question uh, that says, "What are the reasons for the need for the pitch correction?" Um, that is a good question. So let me go back to the slides. So. Actually, um, if we don't uh, uh, address this pitch correction, uh, then the um, I actually I should have brought the better picture for this because I mean it doesn't explain how the spin precession plane is tilted by the vertical direction, but actually it does. So um, what we are looking for is actually is the horizontal um, horizontal precession because our detectors are, are aligned radially uh, surrounding the storage ring. And our G minus, two, G minus two oscillation is supposed to be perpendicular to the magnetic field direction, which is vertical. So uh, the spin is rotating horizontally. But if there is a vertical angle, which we call pitch angle, then it slowly, uh, slightly tilts the plane and it, it also oscillates uh, uh, with the vertical fr frequency. So it actually modulates the spin precession frequency by a, a small amount. But if we, this is a, a significant amount if we don't address in our uncertainty budget. So we have to take this into account. Okay, good. Uh, is there any other questions?
So you may want to spend one more minute to a little, a little bit more talk about, you know, the timeline and then prospect at the, at the end of the day. Um, yes. So, um, right. So we, we almost took like a half the target statistics so far. And the round four is uh, supposed to end the end this month. And then we, we are uh, uh, going to the shutdown and the final run will be expected to begin and finish the next year. And the uh, run two and three analysis is ongoing together. And um, that will actually reduce the sensitivity, uh, sorry, increase the sensitivity by a factor of two compared to the run one. So what you will expect is that this is a run one run one uh, result and the run combined run two and three result will have this uh, this bar half the length. So stay tuned for that um, result. Okay, thank you. Uh, there, is there any more questions or comments? Otherwise, let's uh, let's thank all the speakers you know, for this session again. And then this is the end of the session. And uh, we will the next session will be a parallel session, and which will start uh, 3 30 p.m. Uh, in Korean time. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.